Please join in a moment of centering silence so we can be fully present. I'll repeat myself. Please join in a moment of centering silence so we can be fully present with each other this morning. And now let's get musically present by turning to the words for our ingathering hymn, which you'll find uh, in your order of service. It's also hymn number 110, verse 3, if you're following along in the hymnal. And a happy good morning to all of you. Welcome to another air-conditioned Sunday here at First Unitarian Society, where independent thinkers gather in a safe, nurturing, and temperature-controlled environment <laughs> to explore issues of social, spiritual, and ethical significance as we try to make a difference in this world of ours. I'm Steve Goldberg, a proud member of this congregation, and I'd like to extend a special welcome to any guests, visitors, and newcomers, and we know who you are. If this is your first time at First Unitarian Society, I know you'll find that it's a special place here. If you'd like to learn more about our special buildings, we offer a guided tour after every service. Just gather over by the windows, and we will take care of you, but wait until the service is over. Um, speaking of taking care of each other, this would be a magnificent time to silence those pesky electronic devices that might interfere with your ability to enjoy the service. So please take a moment and handle that simple but essential task right now. And while you're doing that, uh, let me remind you that if you are accompanied this morning by a youngster, uh, and that youngster would rather enjoy the service from a more private space, we have a couple options. Uh, the child haven at the back corner of the auditorium, and some comfortable seats out in the commons or the lobby just outside the door from which you and your youngster can see and hear the service. And as is the case every Sunday, our service is brought to us by a dedicated team of volunteers whose names you deserve to hear. And please take a moment to thank them, shake their hand, give them a hug, let them borrow your car for a couple weeks. They deserve our appreciation. <laughs> Uh, helping to run the sound system is Maureen Friend. Our lay minister today is Ann Smiley. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barrett is the one who greeted you with a smile upstairs as you entered the building today. Our ushers to handle this unruly crowd include Eva Wright, Dara Degnan, Don Lamb, and Ron Cook. Coffee and hospitality are provided by Sharon Scratish, Elaine Marie DeVita, and Rick DeVita in the kitchen. And handling the tour after the service is Richard Miller. Just a couple announcements before we get back to the program. First announcement relates to the Outreach Pride Parade, which is next week, Sunday, August 9, uh, 1 o'clock, and all three Madison Unitarian Universalist congregations will join in marching together under the banner of Standing on the Side of Love. And if you want to purchase a yellow shirt Honoring this theme, you can do so from Elizabeth Barrett uh, and her committee uh, in the Commons during the break after the service. If you support this cause but you're not able to actually march in the Pride Parade, you can reserve a space in our Jeep. We have a Pride Parade Jeep and Elizabeth can take care of that for you again. That is next Sunday. Speaking of Sundays, our service Sunday goes live in three weeks, August 23rd. 9 a.m. 
There are 14 projects for which you can volunteer. You'll find them on the FUS website. And the service Sunday team will be in the Commons during the break to answer any other questions. And there's only one more announcement, and that announcement is, so endeth the announcements. <laughs> so please, sit back or lean forward to enjoy today's service. I heard the 9 o'clock service, and I know that uh, this service will touch your heart, stir your spirit, and trigger one or two new thoughts. We're glad you're here. In our service this morning with opening words adopted from Mo Sa, an early Chinese philosopher. When all of the people of the world honor and respect one another, when they appreciate their common humanity, then the strong will not overpower the weak. The many will not oppress the few. The wealthy will not mock the poor. The celebrity will not disdain the commoner. The cunning will not deceive the simple and the trusting. May we each do our part to help make this distant dream a proximate reality. Please rise and body your spirit for the lighting of our chalice. Please join me in reciting the words of affirmation printed in your program. For that which has been done to lift humankind to new levels of social order, let us be thankful for that which we can do that left undone. Let us strive to give it new life for that which needs to be done but is yet beyond our reach. Let us continue to search, to seek, and to hope. Now may I invite you to greet your neighbor and turn to them and extend a warm welcome on this beautiful August day.
the story. Rose, Ellie, come on, I see you. Come on, guys, don't make me call the grown-ups up. Hi, guys, come on. No, wait, let me see. Awesome. That's not the first one you lost, is it? It is your first? High five, Rosa Pose. Nice. Hey. Anybody else? It's not fair. You're hiding behind the grown-ups. Hey, our story today is about two artists, Picasso and Matisse. But we're going to change it up a little bit. And our story is about Pigasso and Mootis. What do you... Do you think they would like this, or do you think they'd be kind of offended that we turned them into a pig and a bull? Uh, you think offended? I'm, I'm hoping that wherever they are, Picasso and Matisse have a good sense of humor. So we're going to show the pictures up there for everybody to see, because it's about two artists, and the artwork in this book is pretty awesome. So move around if you need to, to be able to see it. Hey, Winnie. Good to see ya. There once was a young pig named Pigasso. While the other piglets rolled in the mud and played games, Pigasso painted. He painted anything and everything and in a most unusual way. At the same time, there was once a young bull <laughs> named Mutis. Mutis was not like the other bulls. He wasn't interested in bullfighting. He was happy only when he painted pictures. And he painted big, bold, bright pictures. I wish you all could see your faces right now. Because <laughs> it's pretty awesome from where I'm sitting. In time, word of Pegaso's talent spread throughout the pig provinces. Soon, art-loving pigs from all over lined up to buy his creations. And at the same time, Mutis was getting famous in the cattle community. There weren't many households that didn't own a mooster piece. Pegaso and Mutis were getting famous in the castle, in, in the community. They were becoming art superstars. But this came with a price. Everybody wanted to see them. Art buyers, art sellers, art students, art historians, art groupies. It was an art attack. <laughs> One day, Pegaso got fed up and said, I'm tired of this noisy pig pen. And at the same time, Mutis declared, I am sick of this crowded cow town. So needing a change, they both decided to look for a peaceful place where they could paint without distraction. So each of the two artists looked far and wide for the perfect spot. Pegasso found a lovely farm looking toward the east. Mutis found a handsome farm facing the west. After Pegasso moved in, he went to introduce himself to his new neighbor across the road. And at the same time, Mutis went to introduce himself to his new neighbor across the road. That is how Pegasso met Mutis. And coincidentally, that is how Mutis met Pegasso. <laughs> at first, Pegasso and Mutis were friendly and welcomed each other as neighbors. But soon, things began to change. It started one day when Picasso criticized one of Mutis's paintings. Uh-oh. <laughs> then Mutis made fun of one of Picasso's. Yee. Mutis called Picasso an art hog. Then Picasso called Mutis a mad cow. Mutis quipped, you paint like a two-year-old. Picasso retorted, you paint like a wild beast. Mutis raged. Your colors look like mud. Pegasso said, your paintings look like color by numbers. <laughs> then things really got out of hand. It was a modern art mess. <laughs> Pegasso stormed off into his house. That Mutis doesn't like my art. Well, I'll show him. And Mutis bullied his way into his house. I'll give that Pegaso something he can really criticize. Then a full-scale feud erupted. 
but it was a most unusual battle. Armed with ladders and buckets of paint, Mutis launched the first attack. He started at dawn. By the end of the evening, he had succeeded in transforming the outside of his house into a monster-sized mooster piece. <laughs> Not to be outdone. <laughs> Pegaso fired up his paintbrushes and in full view of the enemy, counter-attacked. He turned his farm into a huge and outrageous pork of art. Do you think your parents would let you do that to the outside of the house? Yeah. Speaking of... <laughs> well, Laura, anything's possible. Yeah. Speaking on behalf of your parents, I would like to say no. <laughs> the two artists then retreated into their houses and pulled down the shades. Well, I would. Who would want to look at that? Pegaso certainly didn't want to look out his window and stare at a Mutis, and Mutis had no desire to give his rooms a view of Pegaso. This presented a problem, and there seemed to be only one solution. Without a word to each other, Pegaso and Mutis each began to build a huge wooden fence down the middle of the road. What? At fur what? I know. What's up? Well, it's a pig and a bull. Maybe they don't have cars. Maybe they walk every... I don't know. <laughs> Work with me, Ellie. Work with me. <laughs> they would go on top of the fence? What kind of car do you have? <laughs> All right. At first, Pegaso and Mutis seemed satisfied. Both artists went back to painting by themselves, but after a while, Pegaso was surprised to find that he missed that bullheaded Matisse. At the same time, Matisse found his studio empty without the presence of that pig-headed Pegaso. Pegaso pondered, that Matisse isn't such a bad artist, really. He has some interesting ideas. And Matisse moaned, that Pegaso may not paint like I do, but he kind of knows what he's doing. However, being naturally pig-headed and bull-headed, neither artist knew how to apologize to the other. So they did what they do best. They let their paintbrushes do the talking. Pegaso painted on one side of the fence and Mutis painted on the other. Each worked until they were exhausted. It was strangely quiet when they were done. Then, curious to see what Mutis had been doing, Pegaso sprinted around to the other side. At the same time, Mutis galloped over to Pegaso's side. The silence was broken as the two artists began laughing at their amazing work of heart. And from that day on, Pegaso and Mutis became great friends. They happily took down the fence and shared their different views. A few months later, a big museum bought the fence. <laughs> Pegaso called his side when Pegaso met Mutis. Mutis called his side when Mutis met Pegaso. The critics called it incredible. So I love this story because it's about two real artists. Picasso and Matisse really were friends. They really did know each other. They got along for a while. They really did have a big blow out, drag down fight. And then what happened was they realized that their shared love of art and their deep caring about each other was more important than the fact that their paintings were different. And so I always remember this one when I'm talking to somebody who sees things differently than I do, because I really don't want to be pig-headed or bull-headed. <laughs> so all of these lovely grown-ups are going to rise in body or spirit to sing us out as we head on out to have some fun in summer fun.
is from Parker Palmer, Healing the Heart of Democracy. As a nation, we are at a place of heartbreak. We must restore the wholeness of our civil community or watch democracy wither. Hearts opened by many sources of heartbreak in American life have the potential to heal our political process. Such hearts are the source of what Lincoln called our bonds of affection, that sense of unity among strangers that allows us to do what democracy demands of its citizens, engage collectively and creati creatively with issues of great moment, even and especially in times of intense conflict. If we cannot or will not open our hearts to each other, powers that diminish democracy will rush into the void created by the collapse of we the people. But in the heart's alchemy, that community can be restored. I neither imagine nor yearn for a conflict-free realm, a fantasy that is tantamount to yearning for a death-free life. Only in a totalitarian society is conflict banished. Conflict does not disappear, of course, but is merely driven underground, replaced by the public illusion of unity that must be enforced by violence. In a healthy democracy, public conflict is not only inevitable, but prized. Taking advantage of our right to disagree fuels our creativity and allows us to adjudicate critical questions of many sorts true versus false, right versus wrong, just versus unjust. But when our debates degenerate into throwing fragment grenades, we go well beyond behaving like boars and become barbarians at democracy's gates. We drive from the public square many citizens who do not want a life of combat, citizens who retreat into the illusionary safety of their private lives leaving a public vacuum that anti-democratic powers are eager to fill. When one cannot show up as a citizen without being literally or metaphorically armed, democracy is in decline.
Mark Pocan has been my mentor, my boss, my colleague, and my friend. Since meeting him over 20 years ago, I've studied his skill and prowess in communication, whether it's disarming people with humor or inspiring them with idealism. Mark is effective without being dishonest. He's influential without being power hungry. And he's articulate without being verbose. He exuberates a, a contagious happiness, and his bumper sticker on his Jeep out in the parking lot has a paw print next to it the words, bark less, wag more. <laughs> He's had the word peace on that license plate of his Jeep for his car for over 17 years. Mark treats the holding of public office, the, the actual office, as a tool, and one of many tools to bring about a greater public good, instead of treating it as an end in itself, which has become the norm with so many elected officials these days. In my own life, when I struggle in a situation or aspire to be better, I aim to be more like Mark Bocain. And before this starts to sound like a eulogy, <laughs> and because I really want to hear what the congressman has to say, let me share how honored I am to welcome our Congressman, Mark Pocan, to the First Unitarian Society. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I was gonna say good morning if the children were still around, but they're not, so I won't go there. Um, Andy, thank you for that introduction, very kind. Uh, introduction, I was making sure I wasn't having some out-of-body, out-of-life experience, going to find a casket or something, but thank you uh, for that. I appreciate it. Uh, it is a real honor to be here today with everyone. Uh, you know, this is one of the largest uh, Unitarian Universalist congregations in the country. Um, you uh, help shape our community, and you have for well over a century, and uh, I really appreciate it. You're here because of your values, because of your shared values and uh, their optimism. Uh, for the world. And it's with that optimism I come to discuss uh, what most people look at quite pessimistically, which is our government these days. Uh, it's no secret that the uh, public has become very cynical with politics and the process of legislating. Uh, whether it be in Wisconsin, what we see at the state capitol, uh, or what we see in Washington uh, at the U.S. Capitol, uh, it's been very similar uh, experience for people to watch. In fact, uh, they've asked people about Congress what they think of Congress. And uh, let me just share with you a little bit uh, about the perspective people have. The American people currently rate higher than Congress head lice, <laughs> cockroaches, hemorrhoids, traffic jams, zombies, um, trying to figure out how to say this, dog excrement. Um, and even the band Nickelback, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, fortunately, we're still out polling Lindsay Lohan, uh, Vladimir Putin, and the Ebola virus, um, but I think Lindsay is definitely making a gain on us. Uh, and many people think that, you know, politicians have simply lost their moral compass. Um, because of the special interests, the big money influence, you know, they wonder who's out there still for the average American. Uh, because of the positions that people take, they wonder, is it because of the funders or is it because of their constituents? Uh, 
because of the money that it takes to run a campaign, uh, as our friend Russ Feingold warned us um, very, very long ago, uh, people are simply uh, questioning whether or not there's a place for values in politics, whether there's a place for ethics in politics. And more importantly, uh, they wonder, is there a hope uh, for our political process in this country? And I would argue that not only is there a place for those things, for values, uh, which unfortunately uh, has largely been lost in the last um, five or so years since 2010 with the rise of the Tea Party, uh, but there must be a place for values in politics, and we need to get back to that. And I think we have to remember there's a distinction between the people and the political class, especially as we talk about this. So this is what brings me to what I really want to talk about, which is uh, something that Nancy Pelosi very early on when I was a freshman uh, brought up, and I've really thought about it, and to me it really encompasses much of what I believe, which is that values unite and issues divide. Uh, so often in politics, you think about people talk about at their kitchen table, the values that are important to them uh, at home, and you look at what's going on in Washington and you see the disconnect. Uh, but I think we really all share those common values, whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, an independent, I think uh, we all have a certain common set of values and you just can't see it necessarily from watching the issues uh, of the day. Uh, issues such as the Affordable Care Act, the Confederate flag, gun violence prevention, equality for the LGBTQ community, uh, they deeply divide the, the political narrative, but mainly because it's not the underlying values that there's still not something in common, but it's the issues and how they're used. And let me try to explain a little bit more what I'm trying to say. What do people really care about? Well, a lot of that, if you think about it, is laid out in our Declaration of Independence. And if I can, let me just read this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think that's something that we all uh, look at and agree in regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. In our Pledge of Allegiance, uh, we state with liberty and justice for all. These are value statements, and, but what do they mean in real life? I think in real life they mean for people, how do you provide for your family? How do you ensure that we have the freedom to pursue our goals and ambitions? And how do you make the world a better place for future generations? Now, when you look at the bird's eye view of the political process, it can be discouraging. And I'd like to share with you a little different perspective that I've had now with my uh, over 20 years of working in local, state, and federal government. You know, I've changed a lot of how I function uh, from the time I first got elected to the legislature. I remember when I first got elected, um, I would often pull that pin on a grenade, I'd toss it, <laughs> and people would say, what'd you hit? And I'd go, I don't know, but it blew up. That was what mattered, was that part of the political discourse. Uh, and then getting on the Joint Finance Committee and learning what it's like to spend 12 of your 14 years in the legislature in the minority, that you have to have a different mindset about how to get things done. And that means you have to get to know people and how to find out about what it is where other people have those common values. I think you can fight for what you believe in, but the best results are finding the values that we all believe in to convince others. Values drive us, and I know today we see a lot of, it seems like just political infighting, but I think real people, not the political class, not the people in the Beltway, but real people who happen to be Democrats or Republicans often share the same core values and want similar things for our country. They just have different approaches um, to achieving the goals and outcomes. We have similar themes, freedom, whether it be to or from, opportunity, responsibility, cooperation, all of these are issues that really manifest themselves in what we talk about. Let me just take for example one issue that you'll hear a lot about uh, when we all get back in September. I just got back for the in-district period, um, I'll be home for the month, but one of the things that comes up is peace and security at home and abroad. Uh, we now have what looks like could be an agreement with Iran uh, to make sure that we don't have a nuclear weapon there, uh, but more importantly uh, that we're having a peace uh, in that region, uh, which means throughout the world, uh, a lifting of the sanctions. When you look at that, one side of, of Washington looks at uh, military power as a way to achieve this, and the other side looks at diplomacy uh, and less intervention as a way to try to get this done. Uh, those of you who follow or are from Wisconsin for a long time, remember, fighting Bob LaFollette 
was one of the first people who talked about non-intervention all the way back to World War I. And we have a long history in this part of the state of standing for that. Uh, my job in Washington is to try to help convince others of our shared values, that you can have peace and security uh, that's best secured through international cooperation and verification. But it's having those conversations one-on-one, -on -one, realizing we have common values, and then how you can actually try to make that uh, happen. And when it comes to the economy, again, you'll see these different dichotomies of approaches, but still with similar underlining values. Um, tax policy, is it about leveling the playing field, or is it about uh, tax cuts and less regulation? Uh, government uh, for tax incentives, is it about holding bad players accountable, or is it about uh, tax incentives to help stimulate the economy? Job creation, is it about government investment to help create jobs, or is it about a trickle down by helping those on top It'll come to everyone else. The budget process, even. Uh, if we're going to have long-term certainty, is it about spending priorities, uh, or is it about trying to cut down on your deficit? The question that we have uh, on so many of these issues just comes down to these, these differences. Social Security. I think many of us see this as one of the most important programs. And I can tell you from the context we get in our district, Medicare and Social Security, you've paid into it your entire life. We want to make sure it's there for everyone and in the future. Um, but is it about expanding Medicare and Social Security, as some of us like to do, or is it about restructuring and privatizing these programs? Again, the different approaches that we have. When it comes to opportunity around education, public education versus taxpayer-funded vouchers, the environment, what is the long-term sustainability uh, for the planet, racial equality and more. Uh, all these issues are things where uh, I think you can find that common value and work off of that but just understand that other people might just have a different approach, and unless you actually listen to them, you're not gonna hear where they're coming from and how you can try to convince them, hopefully towards the worldview that you have. To break the partisan divide and get beyond gridlock, you need to find out what people are thinking. And that's why I think anyone we talk to, when someone has a different uh, opinion, you wanna find out why they think that and get to them on a personal level so you can understand that. Find out what you have in common uh, with those shared values, uh, much like I think many of us have learned in fourth grade, right, uh, as we had the, the youth who are here, and try to build upon that. And remember that this is, I'm specifically talking about when we talk to the public, but it also translates to when we talk about politicians. Uh, the thing is, I truly do believe, and not to throw a bumper sticker out there, although I do like the uh, WAG uh, more and bark less uh, bumper sticker, I also believe in the, if the people lead, eventually the leaders will follow. And that's why I think it's so important that we have these conversations one-on-one, -on -one, because they'll ultimately bring us to where we want to get. Uh, let me give you a couple examples from my time in the legislature. You know, I mentioned 12 of the 14 years I was in the legislature, I served in the minority. And I served on the Joint Committee on Finance uh, when Democrats had control, when the Republicans had control, and then one term when we were split legislature. So it was an 8-8 eight, eight committee. Nothing would pass without a bipartisan vote. And that was the real challenging one. And they asked uh, Representative Scott Souter, former Representative Scooter from, Souter from Abbotsford, and myself to be the people to negotiate the corrections portion of the budget. Scott Souter was probably uh, one of the most conservative members of the legislature. I would argue I was one of the most progressive members of the legislature, and a lot of people looked at this as a good chance to have a total failure uh, in this area. <laughs> um, but what we did is exactly what I talked about, is I got a chance to talk to Scott, and what's important to him? You know, we all want security in our neighborhoods, but let's face it, almost everyone who goes into the system will come back out and live back in someone's neighborhood. And unless we deal with it smartly uh, by having the right programming, by looking at prevention and early intervention wiser, uh, we could have that proper balance. And in the end, we had this conversation, saw the common values, built up on what we had in common rather than what we didn't have in common, and brought it to the committee, and it was one of the few 16-0 votes we had on that committee. Uh, another time, uh, we had a bill that I'm, I'm very proud that we were able to do, and it took about four terms to get done, was called Compassionate Care for Rape Victims. Uh, there was a point in Wisconsin where if you had been assaulted, uh, about 40% of the hospitals in this state uh, would not provide you with information about or access to emergency contraceptive, uh, contraception, contraceptives which could uh, almost ensure uh, not having a pregnancy if taken within the first 72 hours. Uh, after someone's going through the traumatic experience of that in their life, there's no reason 
that they should have to go hours to drive to another hospital to get this information. And while we wanted to get past the fight that happens so often around abortion and choice, we wanted to have the, the, the conversation about how do you treat someone right who's gone through this experience. And by working on it and working on it with outside organizations and inside, we finally found um, a, a Republican who just agreed to be the lead at the time that the Republicans were in control of the assembly and the Democrats were in control of the House. And by talking to folks about those shared values, we may only have gotten 11 votes on the other side of the aisle and near unanimous on the Democrat side of the aisle, but we got something done that I don't know if you could even do right now, which is uh, able to get um, something like that passed. Uh, that was good by sharing, focusing on those common shared values. And I look at Congress and I'm trying to do the same thing. And I'll admit, it gets tougher and tougher, especially in an era where the Tea Party dominates. Uh, Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky is probably uh, really more of a libertarian than a Republican, but he's part of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, if you know, they used to have uh, the Republican study group was the conservative wing. Well, they were a little too conservative light for some folks. So they formed the Freedom Caucus. You would think again that we would have difficulty, but instead, uh, he's my neighbor uh, in the, the building I'm in, in Cannon. We found out what we had in common, and together we put together a bill uh, to go after NSA surveillance and focus on our privacy rights and try to completely get rid of the Patriot Act. Uh, that's by talking to people, finding out what you have in common again rather than what you don't. Representative Luke Messer of Indiana, he and I are completely on opposite paths on K-12 public education. He's a strong believer of taxpayer-funded vouchers. I'm a strong believer of making sure opportunity through public education. But we got together around the Perkins reauthorization to make sure that we've got funding for people who want to get higher education. And Reed, Representative Reed Bibble here from Wisconsin is a guy who, uh, while he would tell you if he was in this room right now that he is a conservative, and he is a conservative, he also is pragmatic enough when you talk to him, we served on the budget committee together, to realize that when you don't pass budgets for five or six years in a row, maybe we gotta figure out something different. And uh, we're trying to look at what we do <laughs> in Wisconsin and most states, which is have a biennial budget process, and we've got a bill to do that together, and we also have a bill to try to look at how we score, which is how we estimate what the cost of something will be, healthcare specifically, instead of at the 10 years that everything else gets scored, but at a 40 year out uh, ratio. Because if you do that, you might invest more in prevention and early intervention and ultimately save more dollars. But that's what I found you can do when you try to see what you have in common rather than what you don't have in common. And I'm not saying I'm so naive to think that you can do this every day with every person. Um, because in Congress, for example, right now, we are dominated by the Tea Party. And I don't mean dominated by the number of people that are in the Tea Party, because the number of hardcore Tea Party people are about 10% of Congress. But they have basically uh, made Speaker Boehner, uh, the, they're the tail that wags the dog, and they are largely making the decisions. And I realize that doesn't happen. You can't get the things done that you'd like to. And in that case, uh, the political class is not representing America. So uh, at some times, you have to look at changing um, the face of Congress by changing the faces in Congress. Um, but also, uh, short of that, we can try to find those common values and get things done. Now, I know a lot of times people, the thing that probably I get asked the most is, how can you handle being in Washington, right? You're watching the news, you see it, the news only gives you a very small number uh, of what's happening. In fact, if you watch uh, just the mainstream news, you would probably think there are 20 people that serve in Congress. Because <laughs> that's the same 20 voices uh, they put on, and I can probably tell you what they'll say. Um, part of what I like to do in Congress is figure out where we can get things done. Because while the legislative process is largely dysfunctional, I think last session we passed 300 bills in Congress. Uh, there's a Congress that in 1948 was billed the Do Nothing Congress because while they did so little, uh, they passed about three times that many bills uh, that session, to give you an idea of the perspective of the problem that we're having. Um, but uh, I have found there are other ways to get things done, and that's why I'm really proud to work with the Progressive Caucus. The Progressive Caucus, I serve as the first vice chair. We're the largest values-based caucus within the Democratic Party, or for that matter, the Republican Party. We have 72 members. And uh, the work that we have put out, uh, you know, Steny Hoyer, who's our Democratic whip, has said that we're the uh, sometimes he says we're the conscience of the party, sometimes he says we're the heart and soul. I like to think we're the brains of the party. Um, <laughs> but it's the ideas that we can put out there that you see eventually get taken, and I've seen them, the end result of actually happening. Um, you know, I have the pleasure of having the soapbox. I can sometimes get in front of audiences, whether it be on TV or groups, and try to advocate for issues. 
Um, I am glad that we have the departments that we have to at the federal level and the executive branch that we can get things done. But let me just give you three examples, if I can, of things that people probably don't think of right off the bat. And even in this dysfunctional environment, by finding those shared values, uh, we have gotten things done. Um, the Progressive Caucus was instrumental in either leading or working with groups to get these three things done last year that you may not remember, but just to show how there is progress and things are moving forward. One, uh, we had asked to try to get the minimum wage raised to 10-10. Can't get the bill passed. The public wants to get the bill passed. It can't get through Congress. But we got the president to sign an executive order that ensured for all federal contractors an increase to 10-10. When you have the federal contractors and their subcontractors in the economy, that's 22 to 24 percent of the economy. You start affecting the entire economy by doing that. The second thing, uh, we have tried to pass for a long time a bill called ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, to make sure that you're not simply fired uh, from your job because of who you love. Uh, now, we know we have marriage equality now across the country, uh, but in the majority of states, 29 states, you can still be fired simply for who you love. And while we can't get that bill passed right now in Congress, we got the president to sign an executive order for all federal contractors that that is in place. Third, immigration. Uh, we have watched the fight around immigration reform. Uh, we know there are people who've lived in this country literally since they were a week old, a month old. They are a part of this country as anyone else, uh, and they are aspiring Americans. And the fact that we asked the president to sign an executive order to create a path to citizenship, uh, that happened and that got done. Those are the things that we can get done uh, still in Congress. And even though uh, we know in the coming months it'll be difficult and we'll see a lot of rhetoric uh, out there, we can remember that there still is a path to unite around common goals, shared values that bring us together. Uh, we can break beyond that partisan gridlock and we can give our democracy a chance to help people who are struggling to get by. You know, I wouldn't be able to, to do this um, if I didn't think it was true. You know, I realize that for every step forward, there are going to be some steps back, but ultimately there is progress, real progress moving us forward. And, uh, you know, I live in here. I live in South Central Wisconsin. This is a place I love. Uh, my friends are here, my family are here, uh, but I look at the big, bigger picture. Uh, there is hope in what I see in Washington, uh, but it takes hard work and enormous patience to get that done. You know, I often said things at the state legislature sometimes move so slow, they move like a tortoise. In Washington, they move like an upside-down tortoise. <laughs> right? Just the little turtle legs sort of flailing. Um, but it's what gets me up in the morning. It's what gets me on that airplane for the umpteenth time. It what gets me motivation for that 12- and 14-hour day in Washington. Uh, we should be optimistic. And where we can't be, well, then we need to change uh, those who are making the decisions to the people who will share our values. Uh, but I am very optimistic, and I hope uh, you can be too. If you look at that long run of history, again, progress does move us forward. There will be steps backward as we move forward, but ultimately we do have uh, progress, real progress, uh, because people like us care, and I'm just asking you to please uh, continue to care. Thank you.
Our benediction today is from Robert T. Dick. We are challenged to change the world. Does anyone think it can be done? Or that we are the ones who can do it? Or even that the world wants to be changed? We respond in various ways to the challenge. Some, naively perhaps, never give up. Others, the more practical, will do what they can. The rest, not wanting to be bothered, gave up long ago. May our talents and abilities, whatever resources we have and are willing to use, may they be used to move our wayward world in a more just and loving direction for the sake of our children and theirs and far beyond into the foreseeable future. Now please enjoy our final post of Thank you.